Section 9.6, we're going to go over kind of a small collection of things. It's going to start with the Pythagorean theorem. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about Pythagoras. We're also going to work with something called the midpoint formula. We've already seen the slope. That may or may not be part of your next test. We'll, we'll finish up with the distance formula, basically the distance between two points, the midpoint of two points. So we have points here and here. You know, what's in the middle? How do you find that point in general without drawing it? Something like that. But let's go back to the Pythagorean theorem. Probably the one thing that you guys will remember years from now about this class is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. But, well, let's take a look more at this. Um, there's this little corner down at the base of this triangle. What's that corner thing mean? The right, right angle is the right, right angle. angle. So it's a 90 degree angle. So the Pythagorean theorem, as it's written here, only applies to triangles in which you have a right angle or a 90 degree angle. But if you have a 90 degree angle, then you can do a lot. And even though this is a math class, we're going to divert ourselves a little bit and talk about the Great Pyramid of Giza for just a second. So, Great Pyramid of Giza was built a few thousand years ago, um, and it's kind of a, a marvel of engineering for the time. They had stones from three different construction sites, or excuse me, three different quarries. Um, they used different, uh, different stones for exterior versus interior. Each of those stones weighed about two tons, about 4,000 plus pounds and they had to ship them by barge down the Nile Valley. And of course, you're building this for your pharaoh. You don't have laser sights, you don't have GPS. Um, you've gotta form your right angles with a stretched rope. You wanna make sure that your, your lines are impeccable. You're building this for your pharaoh. You don't want a sloppy foreheaded spike. You wanna bring it in on time, on budget. Uh, and make sure that your pharaohs who are worshipped as gods are happy. So, wow. And they did this with uh, right angles. So they actually had, you know, what would today in modern day language be an engineer. It was called a harpodonopta. And they were literally rope stretchers. That's what harpodonopta means in uh, Greek is kind of like stretched against or laid against. And they would stretch out the rope in such a way with these knots so that when the knots lined up just right, that they knew they had a right angle. So, wow, pretty clever. So those right angles happen exactly when you have numbers that line up like this. Pythagorean triples, 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. That's a Pythagorean triple. Another one, 8 squared plus 15 squared equals 17 squared. Or one last one, 5 squared plus 12 squared equals 13 squared. These are nice Pythagorean triples so that they work out pretty nice when you plug them in the Pythagorean theorem. They're not always going to work out quite so nice, but you know where they do, it's certainly well appreciated. We're going to solve some problems involving right triangles. So let's take a look at a few of them, starting with, uh, let's see, um, where is it? Um, here we go, all the way up the top. The length of two sides of a right triangle are given, find the length of the missing side. Okay, so example A. The things to note here are what's known and what's unknown. So I don't know what side A is, but I do know B and C. So let's write those down. B is 18 meters, C is 82 meters. We've got to figure out the length of side A. If you'd like, you can actually draw yourself a little triangle for reference. The one thing to always keep in mind is that side C refers to the hypotenuse. That's going to be the side opposite the 90 degree angle. So I'll put the 82 meters here. 
I'll put the 18 meters here, and I'll put this one here. I don't know what A is, so I'll just call it A. If I fill in the Pythagorean theorem, then let's see what that would be. Well, it'd be A squared. Well, let's just write out A squared plus B squared equals C squared. It's going to be A squared plus 18 squared equals 82 squared, like that. And now I need to solve for A. So we square it out, take out your calculator if you'd like, A squared plus, that'd be 324. This would be 6,724 again? Yeah, yeah, 24. 24, like that. But we're interested in solving for A. Any suggestions as to uh, the next step to solve for A? Subtract 324. Yeah, thank you. Subtract the 324. And that gives me A squared equals 6,400. A squared equals 6,400. Now, there's a couple ways you can solve this. Actually, a lot of ways you can solve this. But maybe one that we haven't done in this class before, but is looking really tempting. What does it look like it's easy to do right here? What's a quick way to get solve for A? Take the square root on both sides. And the square root of 6,400 is going to be a nice, even 80. And then out of politeness and good habit, you're going to throw in the units, which would be meters. And that's it. Nice. Nice. Uh, let's try another one. Example B. Same kind of thing. You don't necessarily have to draw out the triangles if you don't want. This time A is going to be 21 inches. B is unknown. C is 75 inches. Like I said, you can draw out the triangle if you'd like. You don't have to. But, well, let's see here. When I fill in the Pythagorean theorem, uh, what's it going to look like? What squared plus what squared equals what squared? Uh, 21 squared plus B squared equals 75 squared. Awesome. Thanks, I'll send you. So that's going to be 441 plus B squared equals... Be 56.25. Okay. If I subtract 441 from both sides, I get B squared equals, that'd be what, 51.84? 84. And then take out your calculator. I don't expect you to know your square roots this high. That'll be 72 and once again, for good measure, we're going to throw in um, we're going to throw in the inches, the units. Nice. <clears throat> so not so bad. Um, let's go back and take a look at um, something real quick. Are we okay with these first two examples? I'm hoping that they're pretty smooth. You don't always get a nice even number when you do this. If you don't, that's okay. You know, if you get the square root of 80, it's the square root of 80. Don't always expect a perfect square here. Where you do get perfect squares, you do have these nice Pythagorean triples. And Pythagorean triples have been known for a long, long time. So, um, let's see. Uh, do I have it up here? Pythagorean theorem, uh, distance form. Um, there's you know, a depiction of Pythagoras. Pythagoras it was actually kind of a prankster, and Pythagoras invented um, a prank cup. So, oh, yeah, yeah I, I showed you this one. So two truths and a lie about Pythagoras. One is that he discovered the Pythagorean theorem, and two is that he had a prank cup. And here's his prank cup. What would happen is if you filled it a little bit too much, it would start a siphon and drain down on your hand. 
So it's kind of a, a nice joke cup there. Um, kind of funny to see somebody with a sense of humor from back then, but he did have one. Uh, let's see. Um, <clears throat> so this is this next one is actually something that happened to me. A friend of mine called me up one Saturday morning, dreadfully early, but he had a good reason for disturbing my sleep because he said, hey, I'm going to rent a plane. Let's go fly up to Harbor Springs. I'm like, all right, I'm down with that. And on the way back, he happened to notice that we're at 5,280 feet in elevation. Does anyone know what's significant about 5,280 feet? It's a mile. It's exactly one mile. And I was curious. I'm like, well, gee, if we're a mile up, how far is it to the horizon? And I happen to know that the Earth is roughly spherical shape and that its radius is about 3,960 miles. I'm like, hey, this kind of forms a right triangle because my line of sight reaches the horizon at a 90 degree angle. So let's see if we can't figure out what that triangle is going to look like and figure out how far it is to the horizon. So on the one hand, You've got 3,960, and then this distance here, this one here. This is not exactly drawn to scale. I want to find H, but I need to know one other side here. Can anyone tell me the length of this side? 3,960 plus a mile? Yeah, so 3,961. So that's the length of that side, assuming you're a mile high and a perfectly flat earth, or a perfectly round earth. So let's see if we can't fill in the Pythagorean theorem here. <clears throat> Ian, what should I set up for the Pythagorean theorem? How would it look? Three nine six squared plus three nine six one squared, or no? Plus h, yeah, equals three nine six one squared. There you go. Now it's kind of funny. Most people, when they would solve this, would actually take out their calculator and square out three thousand nine hundred sixty, and square out three hundred nine sixty one, and write both of those down, and then subtract. But you know what? Let's just do this. I'm going to move the 3,960 to the other side. 3,961 squared minus 3,960 squared. And then I'm going to take out my calculator to solve these. And it actually turns out to be 3,961 plus 3,960, which is 7,921 is my h squared. What do I have to do to find h? Square root of both sides. Square root of both sides. And when you take the square root of 7,921, or 7,921, uh, you get 89. Which was kind of cool, because it worked out even. I didn't expect this one to work out even. So that makes these numbers a Pythagorean triple. So 89, 3,960, and 3,961, those are Pythagorean triples. Oh, cool, cool. All right, but the answer there is 89 miles. Now, it's, it's cool that you can find numbers like this, but what you can't do, and it bugged mathematicians for years, you can't find something like this. You can't find a cubed plus b cubed equals c cubed. Nor can you find a to the fourth plus b to the fourth equals c to the fourth. The only number that it works for, the only exponent that it works for, is, yeah, this be an n, is when n equals two. That's the only one it works for. Despite the fact that you might see something um, like an internet cartoon that shows you something to the contrary, or maybe in The Simpsons. Uh, let's just kind of Google The Simpsons real quick here. Um, Simpsons 
um, let's see, for Mars last year. So the Simpsons, yeah, I am talking about, you know, the cartoon that's been around forever. Um, the writers are mathematicians and, um, you know, have degrees in computer science and a lot of applied math. And so you'll see this in one of the episodes, um, 3,487 to the 12th power plus 4,000. 365 to the 12th power equals 4,472 to the 12th power. Well, according to Fermat's last theorem, you can't have that. So it's kind of like a joke on the audience. If you know enough, then you'll kind of catch that, oh, all right, this shouldn't happen. It can't. It doesn't. That's called a near miss. If you had a computer with enough uh, calculating power, you could show that that one actually doesn't work. So... Um, this idea of Fermat's last theorem was an open problem for 350 years. It took mathematicians until like 1997 before they could solve it. So I was like, wow. It was actually really cool for me as a mathematician to be alive when that was solved because, I mean, I spent a long time working on it. Let's keep going. Um, dun, 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 dun. So the next thing we're going to work on is finding the midpoint of two points. So this, this stuff right here. When I do this one, it always puts me in the mind of when I sold my first car. Back when I sold my first car, I couldn't put it on Facebook Marketplace or anything like that. I put an ad in the paper. I asked for 900 bucks. Somebody came up and said, 800. Where do you think we met? 850. 850. 850 is the average of those two. And I want you to keep in mind the word average. What do you do to find the average of two numbers? You add them both together and divide by the amount of numbers. Yeah. So in this case, add them up and divide by two. That's what you're going to have to do if you're going to try and find the midpoint of two numbers. You're going to add them up and divide by two. The reason I'm trying to get you to remember this is because there's other formulas that you're going to confuse this with. You want to keep in mind that the midpoint formula for finding the midpoint of x1, y1, and x2, y2 is x1 plus x2 over 2. The average of those. y1 plus y2 over 2. So of all the formulas that you have with your x1 and y1, x2 and y2, um, this is the only one that's just going to have addition in it. Your slope formula, in contrast, has a subtraction. And then we're going to have to work with the distance formula. But let's see if this thing actually works with at least our first one. So let's try this one over here. That's your x1, y1, x2, and y2. If I add these up, well, let's see. That's going to be 2 plus 10 over 2. And then minus 2 plus 4, again, over 2. So 12 over 2 and 2 over 2 simplifies down to 6 and 1. And that's exactly this point right there, 6 and 1. That's your midpoint. Now you don't have to graph these to find your midpoint. You should be using and relying on that formula. <clears throat> I'm hoping this will be easy, easy points on the test. The big challenge for you is going to be remembering this formula and remembering it the right way. There's a plus between these. I can't tell you how many times people put a minus there. <laughs> Let me give you another one. And I know I'm kind of skipping around through the notes a little bit, but we're going to call this one example G. I want to find the midpoint 
for these two points, negative 6, negative 2, and 2, and 4. So find the midpoint. If it helps you, just take a second and label this as x1, y1, x2, y2, and then fill in the, fill in the coordinates. So it's going to be negative 6 plus 2, and then negative 2 plus 4. Okay. That's going to simplify down to negative 4 over 2 and 2 over 2 which simplifies to negative 2 and 1. Okay, no worries. So the challenging part for you is just going to be remembering the formula. <clears throat> Especially in light of the fact that we're going to have more formulas to deal with. And for that extra formula, that last formula, we're going to go back to uh, the Pythagorean theorem. So let's go down here and figure out what the distance formula is going to be. <clears throat> so for the distance formula, I want to find the distance between these two points. So I'm going to call that distance D. But for convenience, I'm going to call this A and B. I want those. The way I've drawn this, I've drawn this like a right triangle. In fact, we're going to use Pythagorean's theorem in order to come up with our distance formula. What would the Pythagorean theorem say about A, B, and D here? How could I fill that in? X2 minus X1 squared. Oh, you're jumping ahead. You're jumping ahead. I, you're exactly right. We'll get there in a second. But what, what's the Pythagorean theorem say, assuming that this is? C would be the hypotenuse. So what I was looking for is a squared plus b squared equals d squared. Oh, yeah. Or I could turn it around. d squared equals a squared plus b squared. If I wanted to solve for d, I could just take the square root on both sides. And as tempting as that may be, you can't write that as a plus b. It's just not. Square root of a squared plus b squared is not a plus b in general. But what's a? a is this distance right here. It's the distance between these two points. If you want to know how far is it from here to here, you're going to subtract the x-coordinates. So that means a is going to equal x2 minus x1 squared, right minus left. How about in the y direction, the b? Well, this time you need to do top minus bottom. So again, you're going to get something similar, y2 minus y1 squared. That's your distance formula. Distance equals square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. Let's practice that in contrast to example G. So example G, I found the midpoint. But what if I wanted to know, well, how far of a walk is it between these two points? How far would I have to travel to get from one to the next? Well, let's see. Example H, find the distance between 
these two points. So negative 6, negative 2, and 2, and 4. Yeah, sorry about that. So this is going to be your x1, y1. This is going to be your x2 and y2. We're going to plug that in to the distance formula. Distance is the square root of x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. Okay. What's going to go in here? Come to help me fill this in. Next is 6 minus 2. You can do it that way. Uh, I'm going to do x2 minus x1. You can do negative 6 minus 2. But it's going to be the same thing. Um, you're just doing it this minus this and this minus this. As long as you're subtracting the x coordinates and squaring it and subtracting the y coordinates and squaring it, you get the same thing. I'll go back and show you. Senior. So 2 minus what? Negative 6. Negative 6. And you got to be careful that there's that double negative there. You got a negative 6. And then 4 minus. Negative 2. So if you're careful with those double negatives, when you simplify that, Rachel, what would I get? Um, eight and six. Eight squared plus six squared. 64 plus 36 equals a nice 100, square root of which is 10. Is it okay if I label these things different? I mean, what would happen if I labeled this as x1, y1, and this is x2, y2? Was that going to change the distance there? Should it change the distance there? Yeah. Or would it change the positive? That would be the same. Hopefully it's the same, right? It shouldn't matter which one you call which. You should still get the same distance. They're the same two points. They're the same distance apart, regardless of how you label them. Let's just take a peek at that. If I did it the other way, it'd be square root of, let's see, it'd be negative 6 minus 2 squared plus negative 2 minus 4 squared, which would be square root of negative 8 squared plus negative 6 squared. But what happens when I square a negative 8? It turns positive. Positive 64 plus 36. And it all works out the same. So it doesn't matter what you call which. It's going to give you the same answer either way. Um, Is that the same for the midpoint formula too? Yeah, great question. It's the same for the midpoint formula because when you add things, it doesn't matter which order you add them. So if, if I mislabeled these, and I did 2 plus negative 6, that would still give me a negative 4. So, great question. Yeah. The midpoint formula doesn't make a difference. Um, the, the only place that really makes a difference um, when you're working with these formulas is, is here, I guess the big mistake I see pe is people um, mixing up the x and y. It's the difference in the y's divided by the difference of the x's. I see that getting flipped all the time. But as long as you're consistent in the order that you subtract, you should get the same answer with the slope um, or the distance. Uh, and the order that you add is not going to make a difference in the midpoint. Let's try one last one here in terms of the distance formula. Um, <clears throat> So we'll call this one example I. Hmm. 
<laughs> negative 9, negative 4, and 3, and... Hmm. All right, I'll give you one that works out nice. 3 and 1. Uh, find the distance. Watching this later on video, then just fast forward until I get rid of the pause button. I'm hoping this one's working out pretty good. Um, let's see. Um, so x1, y1, x2, y2. Our distance is going to be the square root of 3 minus negative 9 squared plus 1 minus negative 4 squared. These double negatives become positive, so it's going to be 12 squared plus 5 squared. 144 plus 25 gives you the square root of 169 which is 13. All right. Did everyone get that one? All right. The, the big challenge, like I said, is for you to remember these formulas. What I would suggest when you take your test is that as you get your test at the top of your test, and I don't know, I think most people are going to be able to remember the Pythagorean theorem, but if you need to, write down the Pythagorean theorem. Also write down right at the top of your test, the midpoint formula. Maybe we'll need the slope formula. And of course, the distance formula. The thing to keep in mind about these latter three formulas is that only one of them has a plus between the x1 and the x2 and the y1 and the y2. That's your midpoint formula, because you're averaging those. Don't put a subtraction between those. The other two do have subtractions between these two. Final word on the midpoint or on the distance formula. Um, 
A lot of times people put a minus here. Oops. If you had a minus there, then you can end up with a negative underneath the square root, which means that your distance is not a real number. Now we'll figure out what to do with that not a real number in section 9.7, but for now, yeah, we can't use it. All right, you can't have uh, what would be an imaginary distance there. This should be a positive number, period. And it will be as long as you square things out the right way. A lot of times people look at this stuff and say, well, where do you ever use the distance formula? Now, that's a great question. So let me try and give you somewhat of an answer. Um, <clears throat> early versions of face, facial recognition software would divide up your face into landmarks, calculate the distance between those landmarks, try and recognize you directly through geometry. I think they're using more of an AI approach right now to do facial recognition software, but somebody could correct me on that if they know. I got a good friend of mine who met his wife online. It's happening all the time. But how do you meet somebody online? Like at OkCupid or Match.com, those kind of things. What they do is they collect information about you and they plot points and they try and match you with somebody who's close to you. Now here's what our distance formula looks like in two dimensions, but you can extend that to three dimensions over here. So this is your distance formula in three dimensions. And then of course you can go much beyond that into n dimensions, which looks like this. Now when you get into the proprietary formulas that these websites use, they're gonna put numbers in front of these squares so that way you can weight things, things that are important to you, things that are less than important to you, will make this number bigger. So if somebody being a smoker or non-smoker is really important to me, then that's gonna have a heavy weight. Maybe I want somebody that exercises or has an education, those kind of things get more heavy weight. Other things might not be as important. Well, I don't care if we travel, you know, something like that. So you're gonna put different numbers in front of here, but in its essence, it's the distance formula. And of course, at some level or another, MapQuest has to be using the distance formula. I'm not so sure about your lane assist. That might be some lasers and, you know, uh, distance equals rate times time. Sensor. Yeah, some sensors. So I'm not sure about that. But here's one. In your video games, when you shoot something, it's got to calculate the distance between a pixel and you know the, your laser shot or your bullet that's passing by and see is it close enough to be a hit so there again you've got a distance formula in there so distance formula certainly gets its use it's not just something that we're making you do because we think it's a good idea it actually gets used comments or questions on section 9.6 looking good there all right let's put this one in the books um, 